good morning everybody uh, welcome to this session the third part on doing mindful while being mindful uh, let me share my presentation i just wanted to see people okay uh, <clears throat> Let me do a quick recap of the last two sessions so that we have a continuity of that. And uh, this session, uh, Shiv Guru, my colleague, will be taking through. I will introduce him further down. Okay. Uh, let me adjust my thing. Yeah. Let me skip this. I have done my introduction. So we went through part one, which is about understanding, managing self through mindfulness. Then part two, we went deeper into holistic mindfulness, body and energy integrated approach. And today we are looking at applying after being mindful, how can we do mindful outside, you know, how can it manifest in our day to day life and uh, work situations. Quickly, we, we looked at mindfulness definition, being aware, in the present moment and with uh, awareness of inside and outside and responding rather than reacting then uh, we did some experiment about observe outside observe inside so that we understand the power of on-demand attention that we have and then we practice a little bit of breath watch so that we can observe ourselves how the mind quietness quiet quietens and we get uh, we experience calmness then we saw the impact of mindfulness on personal well-being, personal effectiveness, uh, professional performance, social connect relationships, etc. Then we also saw the impact of mindfulness through neuroscience uh, evidences, how brainwave frequency reduces and leads to deeper relaxation, how it impacts the neurotransmitters and hormones and leads to more balanced uh, emotions and behaviors, and how it impacts the brain cells and through which we become more a uh, higher emotionally intelligent person by nature. Then we looked at some mindfulness practices in a daily practice, the breath watch especially. Then in the second part, we went deeper into the being mindful part and we had a quick glance of this framework called being mindful and doing mindful. So. In the last session, we went deeper into being mindful part through holistic mindfulness. And this session will be focusing on doing mindful. So in the holistic mindfulness, we saw the interrelationships of energy, body, mind, and how we need to deal with all of them together to be more effective. And in that, we also saw from yogic sciences, a lot of techniques and technologies, so to say, for holistic mindfulness and how all of them impact our nervous system, brain, endocrine system, uh, including physiology, you know, all those aspects. So today we are coming to now after practicing those things and being mindful. Now, how can we demonstrate or perform in the world outside? That's the context. So now I will hand over to Shiv Guru, my colleague. I'll stop sharing. Uh, Shiv, we can introduce yourself and start with that. Let me stop sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Vishu. And good morning, everyone. Uh, just give me a moment to share the screen. Yeah. Okay. My name is uh, Shiva Guru. I'll also go by Shiv. I've been in the IT industry now for uh, close to you know, four decades, primarily with four organizations. Uh, after my graduation from Indian Institute of Science, I joined a company that was called Tata Burroughs when I joined and went through a couple of changes and became Tata Infotech before it got merged back into TCS. And then I was with an organization called uh, Global Automation, which is uh, uh, what I would call as a perennial startup. Okay, those days, the term startup was not very popular. And then I was with uh, HCL Technologies. 
and the last uh, seven plus years been with you know, PM Power Consulting. In terms of my interests and also as relevant to mindfulness is uh, I listen to music, any kind of music. And what brought me closer to or made me curious about mindfulness many years ago was to understand the human mind. Now, how do we make decisions, particularly the intuition, which doesn't always seem to be very logical. There is always a gap. Suddenly you jump to a decision. And what is it that uh, actually helps us develop the power of intuition? And in doing that, uh, one of my other interests is learning from children. We find that the children are always very spontaneous in the moment and very curious. These are all traits that help in us centering ourselves, being present, and at the same time, be aware of what is happening around us. Other than this, I have some personal practices, uh, which I'll not be going into in this session. Uh, so Vishu covered all that we had uh, done in the previous two sessions. So just to get a quick show of hands, if you can say which ones you attended, at least it will help me tune some things in case something we need to elaborate. Or if you're already aware of that, we can focus more on the practicing part. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yeah, most of you have attended part one and part two, which is good. And uh, this is actually part two was going a little deeper into being mindful and what are some practices, the holistic mindfulness aspect. And the first part was managing self more on the being mindful. Okay, probably just one person who has probably attended neither. Uh, you should still be able to catch up as we go further. So this is what the poll said. So most of you attended both part one and part two. So the question I would like to start with for today's discussion is um, whether mindfulness is demotivating. Because the moment you become aware you are mindful, there is a school of thought that says that you are so focused on the present, you don't really worry about the future. You're so focused in the present and just being happy, being at peace with everybody that there's no really any motivation to do anything. But obviously, the fact that we have this session, which is about doing mindful, means that there is something that has to be a driver, something that will focus on getting something done or doing things in a particular way. It is not just about being. So when you look at mindfulness, there is also a question that you know, some people ask, whether mindfulness is a state of being or is it a trait? Now, typically, we say state is like a particular condition that somebody or somebody is in at a specific time. Now, this is something that you would have also experienced you know, being mindful while doing some of the exercises earlier. We will be doing some of them in the next hour or so. But this is something that you actually can experience by just practicing something for a few minutes. The whole idea is about being in that state for an extended period. And then that becomes what we may call as a trait. So a trait is a characteristic that belongs to a person in terms of how we do things, how we perceive things, and that is more like our nature of being. Now, for something to become a trait, yes, some things we are born with or some things can be trained. While being, this is something that can be experienced by others also, only after an elapsed time, when we practice, when we internalize it, that becomes more of our second nature. So mindfulness actually is both a state as well as a trait. Now with this, 
I just want to share some research that was done a couple of years ago, how we actually transition between being and doing. The way we relate to the world around us. If you look at some of the attributes, there are about six of them. What is our focus in terms of time? Now, when we are mindful, we talk about being in the moment, being present. Now, it is more about how exactly are we able to perceive time, whether something that happened in the past or the future, does it matter? Okay. Uh, we've talked about uh, being in the past or being in the future. Many times there are stress inducers when there is some anxiety, when there is some fear, fear of the unknown, etc. But while doing, many times we want to learn from our past we also want to focus on the future, envision something that is going to happen. When it comes to perceiving things around us, when we are in a state of mindfulness, when we are in the being state, many of these is non-conceptual. It's more of experience, as you'll see. Whereas, while we are doing, we invariably look for some models, invariably look for what is an easy way to do it, easy, simplify something that may be complex to understand. So there's a lot of conceptual aspects that are also related to the doing part when it comes to perceiving. When it comes to focus on reality, you know, what do we take as real or truth in our own context? Most of the time, when we say we are mindful, or in the being state, it is direct experience. It's something that cannot many times be explained to others. You can say that, yeah, I have experienced it, but don't take my word for it. You try it out, you experience it yourself. Whereas in the doing mode, it is more about narratives, about case studies, about situations, about experiences that others have gone through and how it has helped them. And then we try to relate it. Now using this, we come to certain conclusions. In the being state, as we saw, it is about accepting what is. Whereas in the doing state, we would still like to evaluate, like to compare, like to justify to ourselves that whatever we are perceiving is something that is the right way or a decision we want to take will be the correct decision. When it comes to the so focus, of when do we put ourselves in? In the being state, we saw that it leads to certain calmness, leads to a lot of quietness about self. It is not about me doing something, me achieving something. Whereas in the doing, it is invariably, now we are the karta. Now whoever probably wills that, now we are there to execute. So there is an association of me doing something about me getting some results. And when things don't go as per our intention, what is it that we have to do? And then how do we center ourselves and then around ourselves, do we change our priorities? Do we change the way we work, etc.? And finally, in terms of goal setting, in the being state, if you are just in the being state, you may say that I'm goalless. And it doesn't really matter. All these things ultimately is about being at peace with oneself now. Whereas when we are doing, it is about being goal directed. It is about uh, either choosing our own goals or something that is given to us by our teams, by our organizations, etc. So broadly, when we want to put ourselves in this world, in the context of our families, our teams, our organizations, you know, society, etc., we keep switching between these two. Many times, not being aware of being is a cause for stress. And that's something which was covered in the past couple of sessions. So essentially, it is how do we strike this balance? How do we ensure that we are able to balance both inside and outside? About being aware inside, and being aware outside. 
Now, these are like the roots and the trunks. And ultimately, the flowers and the fruits is about the external world as well. So that is where these three aspects of sensing, appreciating what is around us, including what is within us, and how do we respond rather than react. And while doing this, how do we do this with self-regulation, that is being non-judgmental, taking it in context, and while relating to others, how do we take actions or how do we take decisions? How do we connect with people with empathy? So this is what we want to go through in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. So there are a couple of exercises that we have. Um, I hope that uh, you have a pen and paper with you because for some of these, it is about reflection, it is about writing. These are very short exercises, maybe a couple of minutes each, and then we'll also be able to share and then draw from what we did collectively. Okay. So first, when we talk about sensing, about what do we see and what do we read from that? I'm going to flash three pictures. And these are all pictures from an advertising campaign that was done by Colgate some time back to promote their dental floss. So I'm going to flash these pictures and then We'll talk about now what is it that you observed. Okay. So please type in the chat window what all you observed. Shiv, I think that was too fast. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay, let me go back then. Okay. Okay, I'm going to flash them again. Uh, maybe a little slower can, now. I can say picture one. And yeah. Leave something like that. Okay. Yeah. So this is picture one. Okay. Now we'll see picture two. Okay. And then go to picture three. Yep. Okay. So please share what all you observed. Okay, I just stop the screen sharing so that I can look at uh, what's going on in the chat. Okay. Okay, somebody has a problem with teeth, this black mark, teeth is not normal. All three showed men with teeth problem. There's dirt on men's teeth. Okay, the females had cleaner teeth. The lady seems to be in perfect health. Happy family. All three men have food debris, loving couple, both are smiling. Okay, men have bad oral hygiene practice. Okay, dirt on teeth. What's wrong with the teeth? The male model is not clear. Okay. Different views and expression. Three beautiful couples with happy smiles. Okay. Okay. So let me share the screen again. Okay. Um, yeah, almost all of you spotted that there were debris in the men's teeth. Okay. But then there were also other things which were not normal in all those three pictures. Okay. Uh, in the first picture, since it didn't come out, you, know, you may not have noticed that the lady had one extra finger on her left hand. In the second picture, there was a phantom arm. The lady was on one side. Both her arms were just dropping down, but you could still see something. And in the third picture, the man had only one ear. Okay. Maybe just to uh, go back. Okay, here, you probably might see the extra finger in the lady's arm. Here, you see that there is a phantom arm coming from behind. And here, yeah, there's one year less for the man. Okay. 
Now, why did we not observe these? Okay. Many times, we are focused on just finding something that we want, that we ignore other signals. In this case, I should say maybe I cheated a little bit. By kind of priming your thought to saying it is about dental floss, which is also in bold and Colgate. And of course, normally what we look at is the face. In any picture, the eyes is what they say we normally notice. And then because this is also about dental flaws, we also notice the teeth. It is prominent, but we missed things that were around us. So when we say sensing a 360 degree perception, it is about just drawing in. Now in photography, they talk about uh, shooting in what you call as a raw mode. The raw mode, there is no filtering. There is no uh, further processing that is done. Every pixel, every little bit of light that can be captured is actually captured. Now these become very huge and then people do post-processing. So when we sense, essentially what we want to do is to look at everything that is around us and just take them in without applying a filter ahead, trying to say that yeah, I'm looking for something specific. Yeah. Many times in problem solving, we need that also, that is ignore the noise, but unless we hear the noise, we wouldn't know how to ignore. When you did the exercise of being uh, you know, focus outside as well as inside, observe outside, observe inside, and leading to on-demand attention, yeah, that is also needed. That is the centering part, but initially, before we take the decision, before we can center ourselves, we need to observe everything. So let's do, one small exercise. Before you join this meeting, in the five minutes preceding this, what all did you observe or notice? Okay. Take two minutes, just write whatever came to your mind, and then we'll see. And after we do this, we'll see how we can apply this in a typical work context. Yeah, Sushma is asking, you can just write it down on a piece of paper, notebook or on your computer, wherever. Okay, this is not necessary to be chat because we will have uh, a quick poll after this. Whatever you observed or noticed, this is about recall. So it is not about what you're seeing right now, just before you join this meeting. Okay. Yeah, from whatever you wrote, you can take this poll. So it's not so much about the specific points that you had written down, but more on the categories. Yeah, you can submit multiple answers. So did you notice more of things or people or were you focused on time? Or is it about what you need to do immediately after this? So how do I quickly finish this session? Or if there's anything else that you thought about.
Okay. Yeah, I think we have reasonable answers. So I'll close the polls and share the results. So this is a mixed bag of pretty much everything. Okay. While the maximum was in terms of things that uh, you all observed, you also observed people around you. You also observed the time. You may be getting ready for this or what you need to do after the session. Yeah. I think people are not seeing the results. I mean, I'm not seeing the result. Oh, is it? I'm saying share yep. results. Uh, you have to press share results. Yeah, I have already done that. Okay. Oh, okay. I think I know what's happening. Just a moment. Okay, I uh, share, they're saying uh, they can yeah. see. Okay. Uh, they can see? Okay. They can see, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, so it means that now you were able to observe or recall a lot of things that you observed. Now, this was something, uh, I would say, the easier part of the exercise, where uh, you actually came, you saw things. These are all material things that you had. Uh, I also didn't ask whether the other also included any of the thoughts that you had. So how do we do this or how is this relevant in a work context? When we say sensing, what can we see or what can we sense in a work context? So the first thing is, we'll do a similar exercise again. So this is what we call as a sense walk. Now, typically, if you were in an office, say in the pre-lockdown day, you visualize a pre-lockdown day. Otherwise, you'd have been able to do this actually by walking around. Uh, since you're not moving, you can comfortably close your eyes so that you can recall what your office was pre-lockdown. And imagine a day when you walk to your workspace. And as you walk through, what are the things that you can recall that you observed and sensed? Because now it is not just about the observation. Is there anything that you felt about the people and the situations? Let's take two minutes. If you are finding it difficult to visualize a day, maybe visualize a day when there were maximum escalations as you walked in, or maybe the day after delivery or a major order has come in. Okay. Now you can type in the chat window because this may not form any patterns, so it's good to get as many inputs as possible. What could you sense? Not just what you saw. But this is something that is not explicitly visible. 
you might have seen people sitting, standing, talking to each other. You might have seen an empty office space. You might have seen some new poster that has been put up, etc. But what were the thoughts and feelings that were going through your mind? Okay, busy, hectic day with many action items. Okay. Okay. We call the office layout, whether it's dirty or clean, entering or swiping the card, security, other colleagues, sight of the floor, deck, the mood in the office. That is interesting. Okay. Heading to pantry. Yeah, most of these responses, except the mood in the office, are about things that you saw. But what did you infer from that? Now, what is the mood that you felt? Okay, people are the flexibility, housekeeping, normal working day, routine. Okay, happy to be back to office and work, yes. And all of us looking forward to that. Okay, new possibilities. Okay, these are again, but what could you sense in terms of you know, what is happening? For instance, based on what you saw, someone sitting, standing, talking, going for coffee, and yeah, Pushad mentioned mood. Could you sense the state of being for these people? Were they happy, sad, or just another day at the office, a boring day, or I'm tired after the commute, etc.? Is there something that you could sense about the team health or the energy? Huddling together, someone trying to solve a problem, or just catching up on a movie they saw the previous evening, whatever. Could you get a feel for the amount of collaboration or communication. Is everybody early in the morning stuck to their terminals looking at oh, what are the escalations today or what do I have to do, etc.? Or are there any potential risks that were also apparent? You know, sometimes just the way in which people stand, the way in which people gather and discuss. These are all issues beyond those indicated by data. Your status reports, you know, the dashboards that you see, uh, anything else which are, say, physical artifacts that you have will give you some idea in terms of what is there. But what is under the iceberg, you know, the invisible part, is not something that you can measure. So that is where we say sensing is very important. At any time, it is not about passing a judgment. Oh, because this person is sitting or standing, this person must be happy or sad. Because this person is wearing a new shirt, maybe it is his or her birthday today. But is there anything more that you infer from that without jumping to a conclusion? Is there some vibes that you get about the mood around you, the energy around you? So that is where sensing becomes very, very important. Just taking things as they are and see what is the reaction or what is the feeling that it triggers in us. Okay. So in order to do something while being mindful, the being mindful part is to just to absorb everything that we see. Okay. Okay. Now, this was probably a little easier part where we visualize the office we knew about it very well. In this dispersed mode of working, now how do you do this? How can you visualize somebody going to have coffee? How do you visualize somebody who is probably feeling very stressed the way they are sitting, maybe with a hunchback or staring intently at the terminal, etc.? Because in the dispersed mode, there are a few characteristics that were probably not there when you're working in an office. Most of us have been working alone. We are connected on chat. We are connected on voice. 
even when we have video calls i notice that the many calls nowadays people prefer not to have their video on primarily because of bandwidth issues and otherwise also they don't feel comfortable saying that oh i'm not properly dressed or there is too much of mess lying around which i don't want to expose okay. and many of our exchanges have also become asynchronous it is not as if we can go ask someone a question and then get a response immediately or talk to them find out what their body language is and many of the communications are also document based there are more emails there are more documents to review there are more code to be reviewed something to be done etc now when you do all these things then it makes it a little more difficult for us to sense so how can we can we sense something from the tone of the language okay. can we sense something from the time it takes for someone to respond we shouldn't get into interpreting say oh what i do is not considered important that is why this person has not responded voice the tone of the voice so it becomes a slightly different set of challenges when you want to sense but you can still sense what's happening so teams have periodic connects not to talk about or to exchange thoughts on something completely unrelated to work people talk about the families people talk about again the movies or uh, anything else that they have seen or maybe the latest the recipe that they tried out etc now with all this what we need is to be able to center ourselves ourselves very quickly so and also to this this to be to do things mindfully while being mindful let us do a shorter version of the breath watch you need to sit relaxed with your back and head straight i'll be playing a guided instruction which is recorded so you can just follow this your sound is not coming through i think you haven't shared a uh, computer sound while sharing uh just a moment no i shared the thing yeah is it okay now you are playing now yeah maybe the volume may need to adjust and just uh, if you have to if you have to play yeah let me start from the beginning yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. is it audible now yeah yeah this is a short breath watch practice now sit relaxed with back and head straight close your eyes Actually, it's not. Actually, it's not audible now. No, it's playing. It's uh, silence now. Observe any stiffness or tension in any part of the body, especially neck and shoulder, and relax them. Take a deep breath. and exhale fully take another deep breath and exhale fully bring your attention to the breath
just observe the breath without trying to control it. Let it be just smooth and continuous flow of breath. Observe the sensations in the nostrils as you breathe in and breathe out. Observe the movement of chest and abdomen as you breathe in and breathe out. Observe the slight movement of nostrils as you breathe in and breathe out. Continue to observe the breath. Gently open your eyes. Okay, welcome back. So while this was two minutes, you can even do it for a minute. Whenever you need to center yourself, whenever you find that you are probably going in a tangent or feeling stressed or switching between one meeting and another or one task and another. So now that we have sensed, we have got a feel for what is it around us. How do we take the next steps? What you call is respond rather than react. So what does this take? Now, how do we respond rather than react? Many times our involuntary actions are we get a stimulus and immediately there is a, an action that happens. Most of the time it is a reaction. Now, we'll take the two remaining aspects here. One is about the response and what do we need to be able to respond rather than react and look at how do we self-regulate with empathy. Okay. So there is a small video. And one is the choice that we can make. If you want to respond rather than react, which is more impulsive, then we need to create a space between the stimulus and the response. So what does this actually mean? How do you create the space between the stimulus and the response? If we want to create the space, we need to fill this with something. That is being mindful. We saw that being aware brings in a certain calmness and that gives us the time and the opportunity to actually do something else as well. So while the stimulus acts as a trigger, instead of that directly translating into an action or a reaction, by being aware, by being calm, that space is where we have the opportunity to make the choice to self-regulate ourselves, act without any prior filters that we may have and respond with empathy. Because most of the time what we do is going to be about interactions or decisions or actions that are going to touch someone else as well. Now, this does not really depend so much on whether you are together in an office or working in a dispersed manner. This is something that we can all practice at different opportunities that we can get. Once we know that we have the power of choice and we make that space and time to exercise that choice. And that can happen only when we are aware and calm. The moment we are aware both inside as well as outside. So the exercises that we did in sensing is to go beyond what we just see. It is about what can we perceive. It is also about what these perceptions are triggering 
within us in terms of our thoughts, in terms of our feelings, which result in actions. I just want to share a few probably opportunities for us to practice this. Okay. Where can we do this self-regulation or where can we apply empathy? How can we make use of this, whether at work or at home doesn't matter. But I've taken more of the work situations, particularly even if you are in a dispersed working model. So there are some 10 situations, there are a lot more that you can explore trying these things out. The first is have some time to dream. It is not always only about what is already given, looking at constraints, looking at dependencies and all that. We all need time to dream. We all need time to imagine possibilities which probably are not very obvious. Putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, that is the first step towards empathy. When you get an email, when you get a phone call, when there is any other alert suddenly that goes up, try to understand the context in which that could have come. If a customer is upset, if a team member is feeling stressed, it may sound very unreasonable when it comes to us saying, hey, I am also spending so much time. I am also juggling so many different things. What's your problem? Okay. Instead of that, what could be the problem? There is also another occasion that will help us for this, which I'll come to. And the third is this, when you get into a routine, it is quite easy for us to be very fatigued. It is say, yeah, it's one more day, one more thing to be done. Let me complete this. So when you start dreaming and you start imagining things that are larger than life, larger than not only yourself, maybe your teams, your organizations, whichever way, you also have an opportunity to challenge yourself. Challenge others also, ask questions. Many times by just questioning some of the constraints that we have, it takes us into a new realm of thinking. It is not about just the ones that we see because many times when you dream, when you challenge yourself, when you want to push the limits, it is territory that you have not explored. Somebody else might have, but for you, it could be a hesitation first. Taking breaks is very important. Just a few more minutes. We'll uh, finish this and then we can take a break, not right away. But yeah, taking breaks is very important. If not anything else, at least it gives you the time to switch context. And while you do this, notice the little things. Like we saw in the Colgate example, there are some things which are there but we miss it just take them as they are because one of the things that i myself uh, realized and i felt many others were also sharing when the lockdown started suddenly we could hear birds in the morning suddenly we could see a lot more things that we hadn't observed earlier because there was no other distractions that were there so even if you went down you can see things suddenly the uh, plants seem to be flowering in the uh, so nice Observe little things whenever you can. And space meetings, don't have back-to-back -back meetings. Again, in managing your time, it's not only about breaks. How do you work together? When do you have your team norms for meeting, for sharing and all that? Use some tools if you want. For instance, the Google Calendar lets you schedule meetings for either 20 minutes or 50 minutes by default. You can always override it, but this is just to give you some space, some time to close this context, get into the next context. And whenever you do that, there's an opportunity for centering oneself and a simple practice like breath watch will be useful there. Mindful meetings. Okay. Yeah. There's always a question that comes that, okay, I'm mindful, but others are not. What do I do? Maybe starting with simple practices. The moment others observe how you respond rather than react, how you are empathetic, 
these will rub off. Okay. Which is where the connect with empathy comes in. Earlier I mentioned that put yourself in somebody else's shoes. This is about understanding the background, the person in the background of the context, why something may be said or done or what may be this person's need. How do you connect with empathy? It's not just always business transactions. It is also about the people as people. Okay. People as people also includes you. So you have to make some time for yourself. Do whatever you want or do nothing. It doesn't matter. But that is time that is only for you. Normally for time management, one of the things that uh, I recommend is to have three buckets. One is the me time. The other could be the we time. We could be your family, your immediate family or uh, your uh, team. And rest is either social time or a larger organization time. Meeting with other teams, and the organization related activities and so on. But make sure that you have some me time. Whether you are going to be doing some exercise, doing some reading or just have a leisurely bath or a walk, whatever you do, have some time for yourself. And in doing all this, don't forget to breathe. Uh, obviously, we don't forget to breathe, but it is about being conscious of our breath, being able to watch the breath, which is an easy way of you know, centering. Okay. So these are some opportunities where you can explore being mindful while you do things mindfully. So what do we do next? You can pick a few actions from this list and maintain a daily, daily journal. Now for this to become a trait, it is going to take some time, probably two weeks, three weeks. It depends on how consciously you're doing all this. And initially it may not be very obvious or you may need some effort to see, okay, am I doing this? But if you start journaling, because journaling is another technique that helps us center ourselves, that helps us reflect, that helps us look at ourselves from a third person's point of view. Because this has already happened, something uh, you did or did not do, you can reflect upon that. And one technique to make this journal effective is to consider these three aspects. What were your thoughts at that time? What were the feelings that you were experiencing at that time? Could be any of these situations, whether it is me time or a meeting time or a interaction with others, any of these, pick however many number, two, three, four, and for the next two weeks, start writing these things down every day in the evening. Okay. Reflect on the day that went by. Pick a few of these situations. What were the thoughts when you got into that situation? What are the thoughts when you were actually in conversation or discussing? And what are the feelings that were crossing your mind? And what did you do or what did you not do? Okay. By doing this, you slowly get into creating that space and be able to make choices consciously. So that's essentially what I wanted to cover in terms of doing things mindfully while being mindful. Uh, so do we have time for some questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think you can probably... Uh, Unmute everyone. So you can either type your questions in the chat or uh, you can ask the questions. Maybe raise your hand and Malavika can pick you. Maybe you can Maybe stop, you can sharing. stop sharing, Shiv. Yes, I'll do that. Okay. Yeah, maybe Vishu, you can also come on video and uh, respond to the questions. Okay, the 10 things to do slide again. Yeah, I can show that. But anyway, we will share the, uh, the recording as well as the deck.
change your name from PM power to mind power. Okay. Yeah, maybe the M in PM could be mind, powerful mind power. Yeah, the participants yeah. can unmute themselves and talk. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. If anyone wants to speak, you can unmute yourself and talk. And please do share your feedback. So Malik, I want to launch the poll. Thanks, Vishu and Shiva for an interesting and enlightening insights. The next, the onus is now on us to practice it. Is there any yeah. way you can have some sort of a follow-up session? It's just a request. If it is doable, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Based on responses, I think we'll continue because there are quite a few people interested in different aspects. So we can, we can develop this as a community to continue a little bit more uh, engaged way. And we can bring more sharing across people because we have been doing the yeah. talking. Okay, uh, an interesting question from um, Bala. While uh, almost all of the 10 things are related to what you can do, people complain that the external factors prevent them from doing it. Example, spacing meetings. It is not in my hand. In such situations, what to do? See, normally, when um, we are working as a team, and for almost anything, we are never doing things all by ourselves, whether it is in the family situation or in a work situation. One simple thing which we can try is what is called as team norms. In the family context also, See, right from childhood, we've always been told that we have to wash our plates. Okay, after you eat, you clean up. This is not something I can do, cannot do. Maybe there is a maid who will do it. All that could be there. But this is like a norm. Similarly, at work also, when teams have team norms, one is, as I said, bucketing your time into three, saying this is the me time when I will not be available for anybody else. Whether it is doing my own tasks that I have to complete or whatever I do is not there. But during the team time, I am available. Everybody in the team is available for each other. And it need not be just one chunk. It may be, let's say, a half an hour in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, one hour in the evening, whichever way. The team kind of comes to some agreement. And once you have that, then that time is only for the team. Whether you want to have your town hall meetings at that time or something else is not going to help. So once you are able to try it out at your team level and then show it to the others and say this has been working, then in a wider context at your business unit level or wherever, you can say that yeah, if we have town halls, it will always be only between this time and this time. Uh, again, whether you automatically accept meeting requests. So spacing meetings is definitely something that uh, has to be a team decision and a team action. Uh, okay, yeah. follow on questions. Me time may be possible for senior people. Can juniors have the courage to tell the customers and supervisors that I will not be available at such and such time? Okay, uh, it's an interesting thing. I don't want to give a, a theoretical answer because this has to be done. But when you say that can juniors have the courage, it actually takes both the juniors to feel courageous. So as leaders, are we creating a, okay, a trusting environment or an environment where they will not feel that they are going to be victimized or they will be will not be heard, etc.? Can they come and then say that, yeah, I this is what I want to do? Now, even in the IT industry context, whether you are debugging, solving you know, a bug, or trying to work on a design, you need time, undisturbed time to think, undisturbed time to evaluate possibilities.
when you start something maybe it is going to take you 15 minutes maybe it's going to take 2 hours at that time you don't want to be disturbed and if you are using say even in the dispersed mode if you are on let's say slack or any other tool you can set your status you not know, to be do not disturb so that is something again that we have to start respecting so that uh, empathy and the understanding of what the other person is doing is fine now when it comes to customers it probably becomes a little you know, trickier but not impossible there are many companies that say that our call center is open only 5 days a week and this time to this time so which is essentially what they are doing is to communicate to customers set the expectation and which is again something that may not be possible for a junior person but as an organization or as a person who's handling the customer relationship set the expectation this is what it is now, if it is a question of escalation if it is something that is urgent you have those protocols anyway so there may be certain people who may be available on call for longer duration but this is about how do you convert this into practically you know what can be done and the leaders have a significant role to play in this yeah, bishu one i don't no 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 absolutely i think it's about creating that environments where leaders have a very big role to play uh, where juniors feel empowered and uh, they feel they can have the courage to bring up it's like a psychological safety yeah any question i mean uh, unmuting and talking may be easier than typing if anybody wants yeah. to ask question thanks yeah. for asking question because it's helpful to others also <laughs> okay if not we can close maybe okay yeah yeah so all the best in your journey and um, like vishu said uh, we will be happy if we can be of help so do reach out if after two weeks of practice you are either facing challenges or you would like to discuss some things yeah do get in touch we can always have that but if there is a wider interest we can look at some more sessions but then the specific topics or what we want to do Uh, it will be good if uh, you can suggest but there are a lot of things that we can look at uh, specifically we just touched upon a few very basic techniques and some basic situations uh, some of these since it involves more than one person uh, we need to see how we can create a similar kind of uh, trusting environment in an online connected uh, event that it may involve discussion in smaller groups etc hello yeah sir uh, this is yeah. uh, arun yeah. am i audible yeah yes sir actually we yes, have sir. taken one uh, situation where uh, juniors they don't have the power to respond to a situation and they depend on the seniors or the leaders to change the situation so uh, i think the context here is that yes stimuli is there how the person is responding using mindfulness so i believe that the junior person he may need to respond appropriately rather than not looking either from a help or something outside which he cannot control so in that context can you please me help us how i may be a junior person in a particular environment maybe the situation may be very difficult for me to handle so how mindful business will be very helpful to me in that situation is it possible for you to throw some answers sir It's okay let me attempt because i think uh, based on my understanding and then i'll ask vishu to add uh, see sometimes uh, if it is a let's say an email response that is needed okay uh, there could be you know, some words used by the customer or someone which may you know, trigger some negative feelings in us saying i'm doing all this but the customer is not understanding you know? maybe some term that says that i have slacked off or i didn't do enough work or quality is something missed out etc so if i just start replying immediately invariably that feeling will also come out so whether i can not do anything think about it for 
maybe a few minutes i don't know how much time i will have to respond if there are slas or other things or write something revisit that before sending that is one possibility the other is the moment i feel pressured that i am under uh, a constraint to respond to this customer or to this escalation can i feel comfortable going and asking for help can i ask somebody to either help me draft this response or something that is beyond my control if somebody else needs to get involved getting them also involved and updated now that is something that um, is more what we call as the uh, the culture or the operating environment perspective where i should feel that just because i say that i come to you and say arun please help me uh, i am not going to be seen as somebody who is not competent right vishu uh, yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely i think here uh, it requires both sides to be addressed one is for the juniors we can provide certain inputs make them aware that they need to respond certain way and help them to deal with themselves just like we said we said managing outside by mastering inside so mindfulness can help them to become more like that at the same time the environment is a very important part which is driven by typically the leaders uh, because they create the culture and mindset uh, knowingly or unknowingly and if those people actually become more mindful they will create a much better environment so if you have to address this kind of situations you should address both top down and bottom up so normally we call this a sandwich approach <laughs>